We're going to be turning to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. So I want to let you know uh, we've been in Acts and we're going to be taking a break from Acts for four weeks. Uh, we're going to actually do a team teaching series. Every elder in our church, there's four of us, and we will be each taking a sermon over the next four weeks, and we'll be preaching through the book of Titus, uh, one of the pastoral epistles. And so next week, I will get to preach on the first few verses of Titus, and then uh, each elder will take a chapter in that book. So it'll be an exciting time to hear from other people than me. That'll be good. Uh, and it will be good because... Our elders serve us in so many ways, uh, men of God who pray for you, who care for you, who, who bear the weight of the accountability that is on the elders to shepherd you well. And so to hear from them, to hear their heart and teach the word and preach the word um, will be a very valuable, transformative opportunity for us as we go through the book of Titus in the upcoming days. So just to give you that heads up. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4. In the context here, we have chapter 4, verse 18. It says, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So as we saw last week, Peter and John, they're walking into the Solomon's portico. They heal a man. He's been, he's been uh, lame since, he, since birth. He's 40 years old now. He's healed. He's jumping. He's leaping. He's praising God. And then people are listening to Peter proclaim the gospel. They're responding to that. The religious leaders don't like it. So they call him in. They put him in prison overnight. They bring him back to the, in front of them the next day. And they stand before them. And they're like, why are you doing this? By what authority are you doing this? Peter and John, they're saying, we're doing this by the authority of Jesus Christ, the one that you crucified. Religious leaders don't appreciate that. They don't want to buy into this idea that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Messiah and they crucified him. They'd like to hush that story real quick. And so they say, do not proclaim this gospel anymore. You are no longer allowed to speak in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John say, yeah, that's not going to happen. Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to obey you rather than him, that's for you to judge. And this whole idea of not speaking in the name of Jesus, this kind of resistance to the gospel, is still going on to this present day. It's, this, this is not, you're going to see in the book of Acts, the beginnings of what will be the norm for the Christian journey. In fact, just this last week, in Eritrea, which is a country in, in the Horn of Africa. Here's this report. The crackdown on Christians in Eritrea continues. Reportedly, more than 30 Christians, members of Pentecostal churches, were arrested by security forces in recent days. This report comes on the heels of recent news of arrests of 141 Christians, mostly women, in the nation's capital city of Asmara. According to the most recent report, police stopped them in three different places again in Asmara. Police officers carry out continuous raids in private homes where devotees of unrecognized religions, especially Pentecostal Christians, meet for community prayer. The report said they are released only if they disavow their faith. They're captured and they say, you can either go to prison or we'll release you. All you have to do is disavow your faith. This imprisonment for the sake of the gospel is still happening. Eritrea's intricate prison system is known for its brutality, including jailing prisoners in metal shipping containers in the scorching heat weather conditions that often permeate the country's tropical desert climate. Since 1993, 
Eritrea President Azias Afwerki has overseen an authoritarian, brutal regime that rests on massive human rights violations known as the North Korea of Africa. The country in the Horn of Africa is consistently in the top 10 on Open Doors World Watch List. This year it ranks at number 7. If you go to opendoorsusa.com or .org, you can read of countless stories of Christian men and women all across the globe that are living boldly for the kingdom of God as they live, serve, and minister in persecuted contexts. Now the reason why I share this story and bring this up is because we want to see that this book of Acts will, this is the precedent for Christian witness. <laughs> This is not the anomaly. This is not the, oh, that must have been really bad back then kind of life. This is the present situation of bearing witness in the world. You will find resistance if you proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. If you proclaim that Jesus Christ is King and Lord, then you will find resistance. Hopefully not resistance to your manner, <laughs> Hopefully your manner is one of kindness and grace and mercy and gentleness and self-control. But if you preach and teach that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, as Peter did in Acts chapter 4, or Acts chapter 3, I'm sorry, then you will find resistance. But notice here, what we're going to see is that the believers pray. They pray in response to this resistance, and notice what they don't pray for. The early Christians don't pray for escape routes. They ask for boldness for continuing mission. The early Christians don't respond to force and threats with their own force and threats. But they humbly and even joyfully endure beatings, imprisonment, and death. The early Christians don't cower in fear in light of the chaos of uncertainty, but trust wholeheartedly in the sovereign power, the sovereign plan, and the sovereign presence of God. Let's read the text that we'll be looking at this morning. Acts 4, verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. <laughs> Do you realize who's on their side? We sang it in the first song. The God of angel armies, the Lord of hosts, the creator of heaven and earth is this one that they are praying to. They feel no fear when they acknowledge that their sovereign Lord is their God. That word in the Greek, normally Lord is, a, is uh, translated, it's a translating word called a kyrios. But this is actually a different word with a different emphasis, a different nuance. And the word is not common in scripture, but it's a divine title that emphasizes the complete ownership that God exercises over his servants, often translated master elsewhere in the Bible. God owns this world. He is master over this world. He is its sovereign Lord. He is master of creation. You just got to turn to the Psalms, and you could probably just turn to the Psalms and, and put your finger down, and you'd probably come pretty close to a verse that declares that God is the creator and the owner of all that is. Psalm 115, 15, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. 121, 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. 124, 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalm 146, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That's almost a direct quote of what they just pray here. You go to Isaiah, verse 27 and 28, it says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Did you hear that? The prophet's saying, Israel, why, why do you think that God can't see you? Why do you think that he's not paying you in regard? Like, like you're hidden from his sight. 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. This is who our God is. He's the sovereign Lord. He created the heavens and the earth. He has all power. The prayer begins with confidence in the sovereign power of God. When you pray, what comes into your mind when you think about God? When you pray to God, do you recognize as you're praying that you are praying to the everlasting God, the sovereign Lord, the owner of all that is, the creator of heaven and earth? A.W. Tozer, in a really kind of well-known quote, says, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. If you are praying to God, wondering if he can handle your problems, wondering if he wants to hear your heart, wondering if he's really paying you any attention, then I am sorry. Because when I pray and when I see the men and women of Scripture pray, they are not praying to a God who might be interested in your life who might know what's going on in your circumstances, who might be able to handle what you're currently facing. They are praying to the sovereign Lord <laughs> who created all that is, who has all power. There are many metaphors and images in the Bible that God gives us to reveal who he is. But let's not forget this one. God is the ruler of this world. He is its master. He is its owner. There is no successful revolt against him, against this king. No matter how devastating things may appear, I guarantee you, God's got this. He's in control. And he's got you if you are his child. This is my father's world. Oh let me never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. They pray, Sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Okay, so what's going on here? They, they recognize the sovereign power of God. Now they're going to give some credit or to pray in light of the sovereign plan of God. God's not only the master of creation, its formation, he's the master of creation in its execution. The Lord is master over history. The point is implied is, as they look back to the Old Testament, all the way back when David was alive and he was praying and he wrote this prayer, which was an expression of how the anointed one, the Messiah, was going to be resisted. The Gentiles were going to rage. The, the peoples were going to plot. The kings were going to set themselves against this one. And the rulers were going to gather together, take counsel together in order to snuff out this Messiah. And they apply it to Jesus and notice the parallels, notice the, the connections. They list King Herod, who was a king of the earth. Like Psalm 2 mentions. They list Pontius Pilate, who was a ruler within that place, just as Psalm 2 mentioned. They list the Gentiles, which is another way of translating nations. And they list the peoples. Notice, actually, they 
in the, in the prayer, it says, and the peoples of Israel. Why didn't they say the people of Israel? Why did they say the peoples of Israel? Because they're quoting Psalm 2, where it says the peoples plotted in vain. Kings, rulers, nations, peoples, they all are going to resist the, mon- the Messiah, the anointed one. This is intense. Look what it says in verse 28. They plotted together. They all got together to do, verse 28, whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God knew all the way back in the time of David, before the foundation of the world, this was how it was going to go down. (laughs) God is never surprised. God is never reactionary. He's not thwarted. He's not like us. He is the sovereign Lord. He is the owner of all that is. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so even as they're enduring imprisonment and resistance in this very early moments of the church, it's only going to increase from here. The persecution and the resistance is only going to grow from here. And yet at the beginning of it, they recognize that if God was in control of everything leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection, then he's probably in control of what's going on in our own suffering. If God's control and sovereign plan included Jesus' suffering, then his control and sovereign plan will most likely, in fact, Jesus said it himself, will include our suffering. God is in control. They go on in verse 29, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They pray for the Lord They ask two things of the Lord, which we'll get to in a second, but notice what their prayer is. They're saying, this is who God is. This is what God has done. And so now we pray for this present expression of our witness within this place, in this context, that you would look upon us and be present amongst us. Do you see the gospel at work here? The gospel is all about who Jesus is, He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the image of the invisible God. And what he has done, he has come. He has died on the cross for our sins. He has risen again from the dead. He now sits enthroned as Lord and and as the authoritative one over all the world. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto him. And he gives his spirit to be present amongst us now as we await his return. They're praying in light of the gospel. You are the sovereign Lord. It was your plan all along to crucify Jesus for our sins and to raise him from the dead that we might be saved and to give us your spirit to live in this world and to be in it but not of it, to be a witness in this world, a light to this world, a salt in this world that would then testify to the good news of Jesus and who he is and what he has done. And we will continue to go knowing we will never be left, we will never be forsaken, we will never be outside of your control, O God, and so be with us now, be present with us now, give us a fresh filling of your spirit now that we might be bold in the proclamation of the witness to the gospel. The same God who predestined the conspiracy and attempted destruction of Jesus the Messiah is the same God who sees them now being conspired against by the very same people. Jesus suffered, and so they will suffer. He told them as much. Here's a quote. The persecutor's earlier success brought Christ's death, but was really according to God's plan and by his hand. 
Surely any suffering these believers or we endure then is not outside God's control and will serve only to advance the purposes of the risen and reigning Messiah. Uh, this reality of who God is is why I believe the most constant command in the Bible is to not be afraid. Do not be afraid. What do they pray for? They have reasons to be afraid. They were just imprisoned. It's about to break out and even worse, they're about to be killed. But they're not afraid. They pray for boldness. It says, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. What are the two things they pray? They first of all ask the Lord to look upon their threats. They just prayed to the sovereign Lord. Why, why are they asking him to look upon their threats? Obviously, God sees their threats. But this word, this, this language of look upon is, is a direct request for God. It, 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 we don't just, you don't just assume some kind of like fatalistic mentality. Well, because God's sovereign Lord over all things, I guess I just don't have to do anything, think about anything, whatever. That's not what's going on here. It's God sees everything, and yet they ask him to look upon them. God's works are being done in all the world, and yet they're asking God to make this happen, to give them boldness to continue on. They say, God, look upon our threats. It's the same prayer, in a sense, as Isaiah uh, 37, 17 recounts, when King Hezekiah is being approached by Babylon, and there's, they're, they're under threat and so Hezekiah prays, incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. <laughs> Don't you think that's a little bold of Hezekiah to pray, uh, could you open your ears, God? Could you open your eyes? He's not saying, he's not praying that as if God can't see or as if God can't hear. It's a request. It's a humble request. Lord, you who see all things, would you turn your face to my current situation? Would you open your eyes to me? It's a request for presence. It's a request for connection. It's a request for intimacy. It's not that they doubted God's presence they weren't nervous that he was too busy to notice them. The prayer requests are that God would turn his face towards their needs in a special way that they might have boldness to proclaim. When I'm trying to give my kids instruction, I make it a point that they look at me, right? Because if they're not looking at me, then they're not hearing me. Now, I can talk to my wife and be fully paying attention, not looking at her. That's easy. But my kids, on the other hand, different. Um, that was a joke. Uh, what we, you know, you want, you want their undivided attention. In fact, sometimes I will actually like, like kind of hold their face in, in my hands very, very gently, right? Just like, I'm just going to help you keep that neck from turning, you know? Because once kids don't like eye contact with their parents, you know? Whenever there's a need for eye contact, you know what's going down, you know? Probably instruction and what foolish child wants wise instruction. I mean, come on, none of us ever did when we were kids and our kids don't want it either, right? So sometimes we have to help guide their foolishness to our face and say, I am about to pour my wisdom on you, child, right? Shut up. No, just kidding. Uh, you know, no. Quietness is next to godliness. <laughs> don't say that. Um, but the, these conversations, they don't go well if you don't have each other's face, if you don't have eye contact, if you don't have connection. That's what this prayer is asking for. It's saying, God, would you please turn your face to us 
as we face these threats, would you look upon these threats? Would you, would you come and be involved and present in the midst of our circumstances and of our situation in a special felt way? And they then pray to God to grant them continuing boldness. They are now going to go about their ministry as targets. This is not the end of their troubles with the religious leaders. It's just the beginning. And so, in, but instead of asking for safety and comfort and ease and some extra time away for a while, they ask for boldness to continue to proclaim the good news of the gospel. There was a man who went around and interviewed people from persecuted contexts all over, different ones that had served under, commun uh, been Christians in the midst of communist regimes and, 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 and all over uh, Russia and uh, China and even in Muslim areas. And he went and interviewed these churches as he could um, and asked them about persecution. And he, he made a note. He said, when they ask for prayer, they're not asking us to pray that they would have, that they would escape, that they would, that, that the suffering and the persecution would end. I mean, they want that to happen, but that's not what they're asking us to pray for. They're asking us to pray that they would endure, that their faith would remain strong, that their hope in the kingdom would be strong because their children are dying and their friends are being persecuted and their fathers are being imprisoned. And they need strength to endure. That's how we pray. That's how we pray as followers of Jesus. That we would endure suffering. I want us to notice that these early disciples are prioritizing the mission of God. The mission of God. That's what's driving them. Not the mission of their family. Not the mission of their life journey. Not the mission of their American dream. But the mission of the kingdom of God. That's what's driving them. They refuse to be stifled. They won't be sidetracked. No threat will keep them from their all-out purpose given to them by Jesus himself. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is our mission. That is our charge. That is our commission. We commissioned lead servants this morning for a particular task, but it all fits within this full commission of Jesus in order for us to be making disciples. The mission of God continues as the church bears witness to the gospel. Do you realize that as a disciple that you have the same call? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, you and I have this charge from Jesus to be about the mission of God. To be a disciple maker. To pray for boldness and to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Have you, have you ever prayed this in your life? Have you ever sat in your seat in your home or gotten on your knees in your home and said, Lord, help me be bold. Help me proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Help me not to fear the raised eyebrows that my neighbors will give me if I actually talk like Jesus is important to my life. Have you given a thought to the fact that God wants you to be a witness to the glory and power of Jesus with your neighbors, your co-workers, your family, your friends. That this is everything, this is the mission, this is the priority, this is number one on the charge, on the commission, on the task that God's given us. And that all the, all the ways we, we prioritize our lives, you know, we always have, you know, our priority list. You know, and, and, and that even your, even your charge to care for your family well is because that is your main disciple-making task. That raising children is just making disciples in a generational way. 
to pray for them, to care for them, to train them in wisdom, to give them the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's making disciples. That's why the family is so important. Not because the family is some distinct reality apart from the kingdom of God. It's because God wants to reign and rule as king over your family. Which means if your family is threatened, that your main call is to help your family endure the suffering. I, read it, I, almost, I almost read it this morning. I didn't bring it with me, but it's a story of a mom who had to have a conversation with her 12-year-old daughter. And that she might have been younger when she first had the conversation, but basically said, they're going to come and take mommy and daddy away, and here's what you do when that happens. Her training of her child was here's how you're going to respond here's how we respond when we are threatened and attacked for our belief in Jesus Christ and sure enough they came and took mom and dad away and they were imprisoned and when they found out they had a daughter they ceased all contact so the mom didn't know how her daughter was doing she didn't know what was going on and the whole time her daughter is praying for them because the kingdom of God the mission of God Boldness to proclaim the gospel is the call. Maybe you're thinking, I don't think I would know what to say, Ben. I don't, I don't have training. I don't know what the gospel of the kingdom, you, you talk about this gospel, you talk about this kingdom, and, and it seems like words that I know are biblical, but I don't really know that I could articulate that to someone else. I found that Many people, it's not that they don't want to be bold or that they don't want to evangelize. They don't want to proclaim the gospel. It's just they feel incompetent and uneducated in the language of the gospel. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe it's not that you don't have the heart to be a part of God's mission and kingdom. You just always feel inadequate because you don't know the words to say. I don't, I don't have all the theological training that you have. Two things. You have the same spirit in you that is in me, that is in these apostles, that is in these disciples. If you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit has gifted you with particular gifts that will serve not only the edification of the church, but can be then empowered for the advancement of the gospel in the world. And that you don't have to be able to do everything. You don't have to be an apologetic scholar. You don't have to be able, you do need to be able to speak the gospel. If you can't speak the gospel, then here's what I would say. I would say, first of all, pray for boldness. And secondly, get educated on what the gospel is. Give yourself time and space to know and understand the gospel so that you might articulate it. If you can't articulate the gospel, then you don't really know the gospel. I, I have seen people study hours and hours for real estate tests, driver's tests, SAT exams, CPA certification, and other ways of work advancement or academic movement. I've seen people give their life to these things hour upon hour upon hour. What if you applied the way you think about work or the way you think about education? What if you applied that to the way you think about the mission of God? It's not that you can't know how to articulate the gospel. It's not that you can't understand the things of the kingdom and the things of the gospel. If you have the Spirit of God in you, one of His works is to illuminate the truth of Scripture to us that we can then know it and proclaim it. So my encouragement for you this morning is if this feels uncomfortable, if you're like, I can't pray this prayer of boldness, I feel so inadequate when it comes to teaching and proclaiming and, and articulating the gospel. You don't have to be trained in all theology, but every disciple must know the gospel. Must be able to articulate who Jesus is and what he has done and the promise he has made about his return. When it comes to our Christian call to mission for the kingdom of God, often we throw our hands up in the air and say that's too hard. 
or we expect the learning and action of it to be easier than it is. Either way, give yourself to prayer, the word, and reading that clues you into the gospel of the kingdom that we are called to proclaim. Okay, don't miss verse 31. I've only gotten to everything but the last verse, and this is like, this is actually the most important verse. I've got five minutes, and I'm getting to the most important verse of the whole text. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and so continued to speak the word of God with boldness. (laughs) This is not a try-harder sermon. This is not a guilt you into proclaiming the gospel sermon. This is a call to our church to pray. And to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us. Because if he does not come and fill us, there will be no advancing mission. If he doesn't do the work in our hearts first, then we're just going to be people trying our best. And it's going to always fall short. Because apart from the power of God, the gospel will not succeed. There's power in the gospel message. And as it's delivered, it's it's empowered by this Spirit of God that then awakens people to hear it well and to respond to it with repentance and faith. Can we pray as a church for a fresh filling of the Spirit? The mission continues with divine momentum, one author says. And to quote an early church father, I love this, John Chrysostom, I don't know if that's how you say his name, it's close enough, He was doing a sermon on this text, and he noted, if you look, it says, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. And so here's what he says. He says that the place being shaken made them even the more unshaken. The place was shaken by the Holy Spirit, which then produced in them an unshaken boldness. To proclaim the gospel, we must have the empowering of the Spirit. And for that, we must pray. So I do want you to give yourself to know the gospel, to learn the gospel, to become comfortable talking about the gospel, to understand it, that you might articulate it. But what we really need on top of that, that's good, we need that. But what we really need is God. (laughs) It's God. We need to be like Moses who says, if you don't go with us, then we're not even going to attempt this thing. The Holy Spirit has been given to his people to empower us. We need a fresh filling of the Spirit. We are so prone to apathy and indifference to the call of Jesus. We're so easily lulled into sleep by the affluence of our age. We are quickly distracted by money, pleasure, comfort and entertainment we don't even need anyone conspiring against us (laughs) we keep ourselves way too busy and distracted to be a part of this mission of the kingdom there's not even a need for a a threat an enemy because we we do it to ourselves and keeping ourselves from the priority of the mission of the kingdom of god May we pray for boldness. May God send us a fresh filling of his spirit into us, his church, that we might with divine momentum start loving our neighbors well. We have here a great example of a people. When they prayed, they prayed to a sovereign, powerful God who has a sovereign plan, who has given us by his spirit, his sovereign presence. We are now in his arms, able and empowered and indwelt to go. So let us go. And let us pray for a fresh filling that increases our boldness to to be witnesses to the resurrected and reigning Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you've never prayed a prayer for boldness. If you've never asked the Spirit to fill you, that you might be bold for the kingdom of God, if you've forgotten the priority of the mission of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, then would you please pray right now 
Would you right now in your chair pray one of those prayers or pray a prayer of repentance for how you've grown distracted and diverted from the mission that God's calling you into? Father, thank you that you are the sovereign Lord and that you are the maker of heaven and earth and that you were in control as your son was sent because you loved this world. You gave him up for us that we might know eternal life. You, you sent him to the cross and, and, and he in line with you because you are one was working in tandem and there was this great mystery of, of your own giving of yourself to us that you might take our sin, that you might destroy and bring to shame the enemies and the rulers and the powers and the authorities of this world. And Lord, you did all this you endured, you allowed your son to endure death and to come to life again that we might be saved. And so now we look to King Jesus and we pray that you would empower us by your spirit for boldness. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your spirit, that we would be a church that is hungry for more of you, that doesn't try to do things on our own or within our own strength, but that we would be strong in the strength of the Lord in the strength of your might, O oh God, would you help us to depend on you in all things, to recognize you as master of all things, and to run to you, and to be the light you've called us to be. We ask this in the power of Jesus Christ. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask this because we know your spirit is in us. And even where we're praying, even now, not how we ought, Lord, your spirit is interceding for us on our behalf. And so we ask that you would look upon us and give us a fresh filling. And it's in Jesus Christ in my prayer. Amen.